are here in the Founder Studio and we are showing you our new Hello. look for online church. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Mayor's Road. Thank you so much for joining us. We are here in the Founder Studio showing you the new look for Mayor's Online. Today we've got Pete Gregg speaking. Before we hear from him, we've got Holly with us, who is part of the student team. So let's hear from Hi, my name's Holly. Uh, me and my husband Robbie are the student pastors here at Emmaus Road Guildford. And we just wanted to share a little bit just about what's been going on with students. One really amazing story was uh, last term we heard about Christmas kindness and we heard Pete uh, Burton's amazing talk on James 5, just about money and wealth. And we just wanted to take it on and, and put it into action. So we got all our students together on a Tuesday night here in the Founder Studio and we said to them, we're going up to Sainsbury's and we're just going to go and get loads of amazing gifts for people for, for Christmas kindness, for them to give out to children and people that might not get gifts on Christmas Day. And the students just went mad. We took over Sainsbury's on the high street. Um, they just blew us away with their generosity and it was so wonderful to be able to then go and bring all of those gifts that were bought by the students to uh, the lighthouse to give to them to give out Christmas kindness. So that was amazing. We just wanted to share that with you. It was absolutely beautiful. But we're so excited for students this term. Me and Robbie have been praying so much and just listening to the Lord for this term and we are so excited for what is going to happen. Uh, we've heard so much from God about it and we just know that it's going to be a year of just really going deeper with the Lord and creating disciples to be commissioned into a broken world. So we would just love your prayers for the students, just for um, just that they would be able to just really tangibly experience God and his love and his presence um, as we grow and as we go deeper with him and as we just grow together in fellowship and community and yeah, just that. So thank you so much for hearing from me and have an amazing morning. Amazing, so cool. Uh, what a great way to start the service. So we've now got Pete Gregg speaking, so over to him. Let me, um, let me just uh, pray for Pete as he comes up to speak to us uh, as he starts a new teaching series this morning. So, Father, thank you for Pete. Thank you for everything that you have put on his heart to share with us this morning. We pray that uh, as he speaks, so you would speak through him. And as he speaks, Lord, our ears would hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Bill. And um, it is so lovely to be back with you all, um, and we're back from sabbatical, so uh, thank you for letting us go on that, and to be speaking to you at the start of this significant new uh, year. Uh, I want, uh, I, I'm sort of dashing around uh, right now like Annika Rice, as you remember um, that, that series, but um, I spoke at the first service here this morning, over, just come back from Aldershot, uh, well, it's sunnier in Aldershot than Guildford. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, back at Guildford, um, evening service tonight. So it's great fun. And one of the unexpected blessings of being away for a bit is that you kind of come back and you see the familiar with fresh eyes. I believe one of the things God wants to do for many people here today at the start of this year is give you fresh eyes for familiar things. And uh, Sammy and I, therefore, have been sort of coming back and looking at all sorts of things around Emmaus and, and saying, wow, we, we feel like, you know, grandparents, and they say, oh, haven't you grown? <laughs> and you're, yeah, obviously. <laughs> and and we, 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 keep, we keep looking at things and saying, wow, I mean, just now. I arrived here and trying to get into the building, someone looked at me and said, I'm afraid there's no more room in there. You can't come in. <laughs> I said, it's fine by me. And someone else said, he's a speaker. Don't let him get away. <laughs> wow. I mean, this story doesn't get out, does it? That if you believe the press, the church is in terminal decline. There's another story being written. And, and every time we see what God is doing, something in us just says, Wow. You know, the, the worship, fantastic worship. Don't these guys do a great job leading us to worship? Let's, let's not take that for granted. I, I grew up in a church where all, all the songs were at least 150 years old. And you go, oh, yeah, the old classics. No! 40 days and 40 nights. 
Charles Wesley wrote 700 plus hymns. I know 7,000. Anyway, lots. There's only about 10 good ones. Those are the ones we all sing. We were allowed a few 1970s songs as well from the Fisher folks. Yeah, some, some of you getting all emotional at this point. I want to say this. Thank God for new songs. Thank God for great musicians. Thank God that they turn up at 7 a.m. or something to get their instruments in tune. Thank God that it's all just to facilitate us worshipping the Lord. Um, last week, wonderful worship. was so brilliant. Anne Mathis sharing about Cap fighting against uh, debt. Uh, prophetic words being shared. And Sam and I just said, wow. And then we went over to Woking. We had to queue to get into the Woking congregation. And, the, and we said, wow, again. And then in the week, I was talking to Holly and Robbie, uh, who head up our student work. I said, how was your Christmas? And they said, well, we fasted a lot. I said, what were you doing fasting at Christmas? You're going to be feasting. And they said, yeah, but, but we had to pray a lot as well. I said, why? They said, well, we were terrified when we agreed to take on even the student work here last September. And we were told there'd be 30 of them. There are 70 of them, 70 students, bigger than many churches. We're so out of our depth. And we just said, wow, that's brilliant. And, uh, and, then, and then I was asking, well, how did Christmas kindness go? You know, that's when we give away packs of all kinds of good stuff to people who are struggling and finding life difficult at Christmas. You know, uh, 13 months ago, so in Christmas 2020, we gave out 400 packs to the needy. Brilliant. So I said, how did it go? They said, this Christmas, we gave out 1,100 packs in Guildford, Woking, and Aldershot. Isn't that brilliant? That's, thank you, guys. You put the money into this. You put the time into this. 800 of those 1,100 uh, 1, packs uh, were to children who just wouldn't have had toys at Christmas. But guess what? There are people of faith who believe in good news and that Jesus is alive and he makes a difference and are willing to live for others and not themselves. And so it's only a little thing, but it's a big thing. If you're a kid, you got a toy at Christmas because the church is alive. And 200 of those 1,100 packs were food parcels for the food bank because not everyone can even afford to properly put food on the table at Christmas. And we hear these things and see these things and say, wow. And, and, and then we turned up at the lighthouse on Monday, and John there was up a ladder, because the, 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 the shop next door has, has, has shut down, and it was a bit of a mess, wasn't it? And John's been working how many weeks, John? The last eight weeks, full time, and it now looks fabulous. It is so nice, and it's going to be a space for Jigsaw. That's the work we do with children and single mums and all the rest of it, and it's going to be a coffee shop and a play area and all of, all of that. And uh, he showed me around, and we just went, wow, this is amazing. Such a shame that all the hundreds of children are going to mess it up. <laughs> John's actually nodding. <laughs> if you're near Don, just stretch out a hand and bless him. And then I, 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 I uh, saw, was it week before last, this beautiful old wooden, like, shepherd's hut turned up, pulled by a Land Rover, onto the Waverley Abbey estate, you know, where prayer began on that site, like, in, what was it, like 1,300, 1,400 years ago on that site. And, 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 you know, to see this shepherd's hut coming onto this site that they're calling Hern Hut, as a place of prayer in that ancient place of prayer, and people are getting in touch with me saying, can I use it? And I just said, wow, this is great. And then I, I have the genuine privilege of leading our church prayer meeting at 8 a.m. every Monday morning. So I log on last Monday thinking, well, I've been away for a while. It's a rainy January. I suspect it's like an Agatha Christie. There'd just be like three suspicious-looking people wandering around, and one of them's a murderer. <laughs> the other two are toast. <laughs> and instead, there was almost 100 people at our church prayer meeting. And by the way, that's not our church prayer meeting. That's just one of, I think, 14 prayer meetings that we have through the week. It's probably Jill will correct me. It's probably more than that. But loads of praying. And boy, those guys know how to pray. One of our church members who, who's in Eritrea right now, which is a deeply broken country, and he led our prayers for Eritrea, from Eritrea. Another of our church members who's fluent in Farsi 
led our prayers for Afghanistan. I came out of that prayer meeting dancing. It's a dangerous thing to do when you live on a barge. It's like, wow, this is so good. And then I, I got a, a WhatsApp message in the week uh, from one of our elders who said this. I just want to give a big shout out to Sam Ray and the children's team. Before Christmas, Sam, Matt, and the Emmaus team, along with Park Church in Aldershot, were involved in hosting the Christmas Assembly for Park Primary School. A cousin of ours happens to work there, and one of the other teachers said it was the best Christmas assembly she had seen in years. The team pitched it at just the right level for the children, and I'm guessing from how pleased they were that they'll be asking us again. So wonderful to hear totally unsolicited great reports. That brilliant, our kids' work team, youth team out there uh, in the schools making a difference. And it made us say, wow. You know, Sammy and I have poured our adult life into trying to serve the church. We love the church. There's a lot of bad news about the church, but this is a 2,000-year-old, 2 billion-strong conspiracy ganging up around the world to fight injustice, to love people, and we are unashamed about the fact that we believe that God looks like Jesus, that he is love, that he sent his son to die for us, that there's hope in life, there's even life after death. We think that's good news. And, and you know, of course, that there's lots of mess and lots of problems in churches, but we always said, wouldn't it be amazing to be part of a church that's growing and praying, and loving. And wouldn't it be great if that church could be rooted in the Bible, not just drifting with whatever the culture happens to think is true at any given moment? And wouldn't it be great if that church could be unashamedly charismatic, full of the Spirit, moving in the prophetic, and dreams, and visions, and the supernatural, all that cool, uh, funky kung fu stuff? And wouldn't it be great if that church could also be actively fighting injustice and serving the poor? And we came back from sabbatical and saw you lot and went, wow! We're part of it. It's not perfect. That's why you fit in so well. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd spoil it. So would I. We're kind of making it up as we go along, but the Lord is with us. So I'm so grateful to Adam Heather for you know, leading things whilst we've been off, to Bill Kuzak for doing a great job leading this congregation, and, and also just for being the kind of church that's led by team, so it's not all on Sammy and me, and that believes in us, not just what we do, but us, and gave us that space to spend that time focusing on each other and the Lord. So I just want to share uh, a few reflections, if I may, from particularly the pilgrimage that I undertook uh, on sabbatical, walking 300-odd miles, something very odd, uh, from Iona to Lindisfarne two of the great ancient seats of our faith in this nation, the Scottish island of Iona and uh, uh, Lindisfarne Holy Isle up in Northumbria. And, and, and I want to take some of the reflections from that time alone with the Lord and apply them to the year on which we're all embarking and also use them to prime the pumps for a teaching series that we're just beginning called Becoming which is going to be all about discipleship. It's going to be challenging, but we are determined at the start of this new year to actually follow in the footsteps of Jesus, to grow, to be changed into his likeness through the coming year. So let's read together Psalm 84. Uh, we're going to read verses 5 to 7, and I'd invite you, if you're able to do so, to stand as a sign of respect for God's word. Psalm 84, verse 5 to 7. Uh, I'll read it out. You don't need to join in, but um, this, is the, this is the word of God. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Bokor, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each bef appears before God in Zion. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, I was just trying to find out how many Anglicans we had in the room. Please be seated. <laughs> it's a trick. Bind us together. According to this psalm, there is a particular blessing from God for those who set their heart on pilgrimage. 
who set their heart on pilgrimage. And I, I don't think that is just the very literal uh, sort of pilgrimage that I had the privilege of undertaking. I think setting your heart on pilgrimage is about an outlook on life that sees it as a journey with Christ and unto Christ. I think that's the way we can view the coming year, as a pilgrimage with Christ, unto Christ, come what may. And in many ways, this metaphor of pilgrimage gets right to the heart of the very notion of true discipleship. You probably know that the Bible talks about discipleship a lot. It uses the word disciple or discipleship 269 times. Does anyone know how many times the Bible uses the word Christian? Slightly more than one? Slightly less than three? Yes, well done. We got, we, we, well done. That's fantastic. We got there in the end. The expense of education paying off. Um, the Bible only actually used the word Christian twice, which is weird, isn't it? Because we spend so much of our time saying, you know, I became a Christian in 1973 at 3 a.m. just outside the KFC in Hull. You know, if that was a word for anyone here. <laughs> wow. Or, 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 you know, we talk about being Christians. And yet, in fact, we're told in the Bible that the very word Christian was a nickname originally. It was given to the followers of the way. See, it's journey, it's pilgrimage, it's process. And so I wonder what would happen if we started to talk more about being disciples of Jesus rather than just passively people who kind of believe certain creedal statements and self-identify with a particular religious tribe called Christian. In Matthew 4 verse 19, Jesus kicks the whole thing off by going up to a bunch of smelly, sweaty fishermen and saying, Oi, lads, leave your nets. Come on, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. That was the invitation. Come follow me. And so there is an invitation to us at the start of this year to be people who say, I'm going to listen to you diligently as my rabbi. I, I, I'm going to learn from you. I'm going to seek to speak your words in every situation I'm in. I'm going to seek to do your deeds each day. When I mess up, I'll pick myself up. I'm going to follow again because I am in this not just to kind of survive as some kind of religious entity, but to thrive as a follower of the living Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be challenged and I want to be changed into his likeness. Let me give you a picture of this, very literally. This is a picture from my shelf. Uh, this is our son, Danny. Uh, now, I can tell you it was his birthday literally this time last week. So this was 19 years ago. And there's this little boy in his Tigger pajamas, so proud as punch, wearing my shoes. And he's got them on the wrong way round. I love that image for so many reasons I'm sure you can understand but one of them is it's actually a pretty powerful picture of a little boy wanting to fill his dad's shoes and not really knowing how to do it a little boy wanting to follow in his dad's footsteps a little boy who wants to grow up and be like his dad hello that's the heart of discipleship I want to follow in your footsteps. I want to grow up and be like you. I'm very much afraid that I don't exactly fill your shoes right now, Lord. And I think I might even have them on the wrong way around. I'm a bit nervous as I look at the coming year that a couple of careless steps, I might just fall flat on my face. But I want to grow up and be like you. I want to follow you. I want to wear your shoes. And the thing with this, discipleship is that it doesn't get beamed down on you by simply singing songs on a Sunday. You might have noticed. You can sing hundreds of songs. It's a terrific, wonderful thing to do. But you walk out the door at the end, it hasn't changed you particularly. It's not some mystical sort of alchemical reaction that goes on. The way that you are changed and the way that you become a follower of Jesus 
is through diligence and perseverance and effort. This is contrary to what we are often taught. We have so emphasized that we are unconditionally loved, which we are, that we are saved by grace through faith and not by works, which is absolutely true, that we have made a very serious mistake. It's as ridiculous as if I said to you, by the way, guys, I've got this thing. If you'll just drink water, uh, I don't know, like wearing slippers on a Thursday, you will lose weight. You'll develop incredible muscles and you'll look amazing. Yeah, I know, it's an advert that you've probably seen on Instagram on a regular basis. You just go, ah, ah, it doesn't work like that, pal. If I said to you, come to the front at the end, we're going to pray for you and you're going to be a world-class tennis player at the end. And you're going to get a visa to play in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it was good to pray for the government earlier. I now know why they're called political parties. And uh, so, <laughs> and, but, it, but you'd say, Pete, this is nonsense. It doesn't work like that. I'll get good at tennis by practicing, by developing muscle memory, you see. And it takes effort. Dallas Willard, the great Dallas Willard says, grace isn't opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning, to earning. We can't earn our salvation, but it takes effort to follow Jesus. My pilgrimage certainly took effort. In fact, it was the hardest thing I've ever done physically, but one of the best things I've ever done spiritually. In fact, it was transformational. It was difficult because I had to endure days of rain, I got blisters on my blisters. I didn't know that was a thing, but trust me, it is. I, I, I had very cold nights camping. I just was felt really sore. When I took my shirt off at night, I looked like, you know how Action Man has those lines around his shoulders where, like, the joints were? I had that from my backpack, just from 20 kilograms. And, you know, it was hard work, but it was totally transformational. In fact, it was a bit like going through therapy. I hadn't expected this, but I actually started calling the Lord Dr. Jesus because every day as I had 21 days in silence and solitude, he, he began to reveal things to my heart about me. I wanted to talk to him about anything except me, and he seemed to want to talk about me. And I, I suddenly began to realize, oh, that's why I'm like that. That's, that's, that's why I react in that way. It was like layer upon layer of discovery. And eventually I shared some of it with Sammy over the phone. And she said, Pete, this is incredible. She's a professional counselor. And she said it would normally take me months to get a client to that level of, you know, self-realization. You're still a complete mess, but, you know, you might not need counseling as much as you used to. And it was just through time alone with God. See, the thing is with silence and solitude is there's nowhere to hide and there's nothing to prove. Just think about that a second. Guarantee every single one of us, even so far this already today, you've tried to hide something, you've tried to prove something. We spend our whole lives trying to hide and trying to prove. Come into a building like this, I don't want them to see this about me. And I want to look like that, trying to hide, trying to prove. And, you, you know, it becomes a kind of psychosis. But after not just a day or two, but a week or two, you start going, this is nonsense. It's me and God, and he sees me sitting on the toilet. There's nothing to hide. There's nothing to prove. And you start to have some real conversations, right? And the Bible says that he is a wonderful counselor. And I just wonder if we maybe need to take that a little more literally at times. I mean, what would happen this year if each one of us made a little more space just for God to speak to us about us in an environment where we weren't hiding and we weren't trying to prove anything? I, well, one of the things, uh, there's a lot of things that God showed me and did in me that I, I don't want to talk about. I will ne I'll probably never talk about publicly because they're private. But, but one of the things was this. At the start, I started to talk to God about the fact that I was, re I just was really, I am really impatient. 
And I realized that 25 years of Christian leadership damages you. And it's not just Christian leadership. Some of you have very responsible jobs in all sorts of different fields. It damages you. If continually you're having to make quick decisions, if you're always feeling responsibility for other people, it's not good for you. And Sammy would say when she first met me, I was one of the most laid-back people she had ever met. And she definitely wouldn't say that anymore. I get grumpy. The way I drive. Is that a word for anyone here? You know, and, 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 and I talked to the Lord about it. And you know what he said to me? He said, yeah, Pete, it's a wound in your life. I'm like, it is? I just thought I needed to chill out a bit. He said, no, you're wounded. You need to be healed. Just the way you, if you were physically wounded, you've got, you got to find some healing. I'm like, okay, let's begin that process. See, and, and, and I started to talk to him about presence. See, I'm 50, I just turned 53. And I started thinking, what kind of old man do I want to be? <laughs> and, and you know the best old people? They are radically present. You know, when you're with them, you feel that they have all the time in the world. They're not looking over your shoulder for someone more interesting or impressive to talk to. Right? They're, they're, they're fully with you, listening deeply, more interested in you than projecting something of themselves upon the situation. And... And I thought, I want to be present. You know, I want to be present to people. I want to be present to the, to the moment I'm in, not constantly carrying over the caffeine hangover from an hour before, anticipating where I'm going. So I want to be present. I want to use the biblical phrase to have eternity in my heart. I mean, what's the hurry, guys? We're eternal beings. <laughs> Got all the time in the world and some. And, and not just present to the moment and present to the person, but present to the presence of God in the present moment. And not just, you know, when, I, when you're in church, you know, bind us together, Lord. You know, ah, oh, the presence of God. But, but present to God in the supermarket, present to God when it's raining, present to God. And the Lord said to me, oh, okay, you want to talk about presence? That's a skill. That's like tennis playing. You're only going to learn that by practicing hard. It's not magical. They aren't just these weirdly godly old people. They've practiced all their lives being present with people. And you have to practice daily. And one of the things you've got to do is you've got to sit for at least three minutes every morning and just focus on the fact that I love you without saying anything. Just accept it. Absorb it. Because otherwise your whole day will be some form of fight or flight. But, you know, when you know you're loved, it's a lot easier to be loving. When you know you already won, there's a lot less to prove. And so gradually the Lord began to coach me on all sorts of things. There was this moment crossing barefoot across the sands out to Holy Island. You imagine I've been walking for days, hundreds of miles, I'm barefoot. It's the ancient pilgrim trail. There are these great stakes in the sand that lead you out. You have to time it just right, you know, at low tide. And by the way, sands is glamorous. As with so many things in the Christian life, the reality is not glamorous. It's actually this frictionless slime at times that you're walking over. And I kept falling over. I'm about to show you a video clip. You'll see the mud all over me. And fortunately, you don't see the bits where I fell over on my backpack and had my legs kicking around like a turtle. This is the reality of pilgrimage. It takes effort. Uh, and, and as I was walking out, the Lord, who I feel never treats me with the respect that I deserve. <laughs> yes, thank you for the largest laugh of the talk. Uh, said to me, so Pete, um, great walk. Uh, <laughs> good job. Um, you, you expect to find me on Holy Island out of interest? <laughs> so I kind of said, yeah, pretty much. I have walked a long way. <laughs> Be nice. And then, of course, I realized the absurdity of it all because he's already with me. And so you start thinking, what am I doing? 
I sat down and ordered a Domino's pizza. No. <laughs> and then I began to realize that we undertake these journeys in life, not to find God, but to be found by God. You understand? I walked to the high altar, St. Mary's Church, on the island of Lindisfarne, not to find God there, but to allow God to access the high altar of the holy island that's my own inner world. And he walks a lot more than 300 miles. He gets a lot muddier and bloodier. He'll do pretty much anything on his pilgrimage to try and get to the Holy of Holies, which is how he perceives your heart. He'll do anything to get there. But we live our lives with clenched fists, unable to receive. And so we have to put a lot of effort into relaxing in order to receive and host the holiness of God in our heart of hearts. And so T.S. Eliot puts it absolutely brilliantly, of course, in his poem, Little Gidding. And he says this, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. <laughs> oh. What would it be like to live this year with your heart set on pilgrimage, with Christ and unto Christ, making space to host him in your life? So... I'm just going to play this tiny little video I posted on Instagram. It's about two minutes long from the slimy sands on my way out to Lindisfarne. Hey, friends. Amazing to be able to do this. I'm not going to take long, but this is a great moment. Greetings from the Pilgrim Trail, the ancient Pilgrim Trail across to the holy island of Lindisfarne. It's first light, it's a low tide, slightly raining, and uh, I've walked somewhere between 300 and 330 miles in the footsteps of Saint Aidan, who founded the monastery here at uh, um, Lindisfarne at the end of the sixth century. And uh, yeah, it, it, there's a, my heart is very full, and I'm not going to say much. But I want to just say this. Those of us who have faith in Jesus Christ, this is an ancient, ephemeral, but unshakable thing. Same faith that Aidan had in his belly, you know, his name meant little fiery one, that same faith that caused him to establish this place of prayer and presence from which he could evangelize this whole region. That's the same faith we have because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. And so guys, I don't know what you're doing today, don't know what part of the world you're in, but let me just say this. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, live for his glory. Let's do all that we can once again to push into his presence like Aidan, Columba and all those ancient saints and then to make his presence known in this beautiful world of his. So that's it from me today. Lovely thing to do. Walked a long way. I don't suppose that many people get to do this and I feel really grateful to all of you who've been interested and who've prayed. So thank you. And um, this is an amazing place. We have amazing God. And I'm off to the prayer room uh, here on the island of Lindisfarne. God bless you all. And the thing with pilgrimage is that it is tough. This year is going to be tough. In fact, Psalm 84 says, Blessed are those whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Uh, they, they walk through the valley of Bokor. Now, Bokor is a literal, dry, arid place in Palestine. Uh, and it, it, it literally means, Bokor literally means a, a valley of mourning or weeping. 
And so the context for our pilgrimage is mourning and weeping and dryness. And we live at a time of mourning and weeping and dryness in the land. A hundred and fifty thousand people in our nation have died because of COVID. It's unconscionable. On our watch in a matter of months, think of all those little white crosses. Poverty is escalating. The division, do you know the rich are getting richer in this season whilst the poor get poorer? And everyone's got their own personal tragedy. I could sit with each one of you and you would say, I've lost someone. Or my Christmas was ruined. Or I lost my job or my business is struggling. Everyone's got their story. This is the Valley of Bokor. As we set out at the start of this year, the valley of weeping and mourning, that is the context for pilgrimage. But notice, the psalmist says that wherever we put our feet, we kind of change the weather, we bring the rain, autumn rains kick in, the springs rise up. I kind of imagine Chris Pratt in Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, he's got his little Walkman on and he's got the 80s tunes, he's kind of, he's kind of dancing, I, he's a bit better than that, but you know, you get the feeling. Uh, thank you to those of you watching online. And, and I imagine us going through this place, but boo, CGI, water, springs, rain, following us in this arid place. See, in Israel, there were two rainy seasons. There was the autumn season, comes at the end of the summer. It softens the hardened ground so you can sow seed. And then there's the spring rain that brings the crop to harvest. If you don't have those two rains, you starve. And so the psalmist chooses to say here, the autumn rains. Why? Because this is the rain that breaks the weather pattern. This is the rain that softens the ground. And I believe this is a prophetic word for us as a church and for many of you as individuals right now, watching online, wherever you are, and here in Guildford. This is to be a year of the softening of ground and the sowing of seed. I believe that the crises of the last two years have softened the ground. People all around us are asking new questions. There's a new level of searching and vulnerability and despair in the land. Every major move of the Spirit began in a crisis of disappointment and despondency. It doesn't mean that despondency and disappointment inevitably leads to revival, but it does mean that when we're in a season such as the one we're in right now, it is a moment of opportunity to pray and to preach the gospel and to sow with our lives and our tears and our presence in hard places and dry places and to be those present in the brokenness of the world in the valley of Borkor and be those who bring springs of hope be those who change the weather patterns be those who bring life where there's death we can either look at 150,000 deaths and say oh well too bad we're just animals eventually we rot whatever or we can say no it's a tragedy because humanity is of infinite dignity made in the image of God. But the good news is that God became a human and he showed us that there is life after death. There is purpose in life. There is forgiveness. We can not just be victims of the weather patterns, but we can change them through the gospel of Jesus. This is, I believe, a time for us to sow our lives into the hard places to be present in the dry places, to weep with those who are weeping, but not to weep forever. I believe God is repositioning and recommissioning some of you into the Valley of Borkor. He is sending you this year into new places of hardship and weeping and mourning. I believe others of you, you are already in the Valley of Borkor. And today God has sent me to say to you, the grass is not greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. This is your mission field. This difficult marriage, this difficult family dynamic, this workplace, and you have been placed in the Valley of Borkor to bring springs. This is your pilgrimage. And he wants to give you fresh eyes for familiar things, fresh faith for old problems. I believe this is a year for us to be generous and adventurous as a church, to speculate now that we might accumulate in the future. 
It's a time to play the long game. It's a time for us to innovate and invest and experiment and take a few holy risks. And so I'd love just to pray for one or two people now, if I may. And uh, I'm acutely aware that some of you here are in the Valley of Borkor. Your hearts are breaking. Uh, and, you know, I, I want us to pray for you and stand with you and bring a little bit of God's life and hope by the power of his spirit into the situation that you're in. It's one of the things we do as a church all the time. We, 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 it's wonderful to see God breaking into the lives of those who feel desperate. But I think for others here, there is a clear challenge at the start of this year to be disciples of Jesus, to set our hearts on pilgrimage, to say, I'm not just going to vaguely try and limp through this year as a Christian. I want to be a disciple. I want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. I want to grow and fill his shoes. I want to be like him. And if I have to walk through the Valley of Bokor and you know what it is for you, I'll do it with Jesus and unto Jesus that he might come into my life in a new way. I, I will follow you. I'll put in some effort this year. You know, I, I, I will listen to him. I will allow him to challenge me and to change me. I don't actually want to be the same person this time next year. I want to get free from some of the addictions. I, I, I don't want to spend my whole life hiding things from people and then trying to impress them at the same time. I want to be like Jesus. And um, I think maybe for some of you, this is a particular challenge because, and I want to be sensitive, but this was the phrase I felt God gave me. You are resenting your present circumstance. You really have been thinking, if only this circumstance would go away, then I could get on with discipleship. Then I could get on with the stuff. And I believe God's just saying, no, 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 no. My dear child, this present circumstance is the context in which I want to meet with you. Don't resent your present circumstance. Find me in it. I don't, please hear me, I don't say that lightly. I know how difficult that is for some. But remember Jonah? <laughs> He's sent to Nineveh and he goes to Tarshish instead. Doesn't work out well. wonder what your Tarshish is. Remember Jacob, he's out in the desert and he falls asleep using a stone as a pillow. doesn't feel very comfortable to me. And then the night he has this dream. He sees angels ascending and descending. And he wakes in the morning and he says this in Genesis 28, Surely the Lord was in this place, this unlikely place, this rock-hard pillow place, this desert that is dry is cold at night and hot by day surely the lord was in this place and i knew it not i believe one of the things the lord wants to do for some of us is not to bring us out of the valley of borkor but for us to wake up and say surely the lord was in this place and i knew it not and jacob called it bethel bethel it may be your workplace that he's calling you to rename Bethel. It may be your family dynamics. It may be a health challenge. It may be an addiction that's just exhausting as you seek to find freedom. This is the place of the presence of God. And so in this church, we do a lot of asking people to respond. And that's because we don't think you can just sort of vaguely feel your way osmotically that was good that was quite dramatic it's a rainstorm in the valley of Borkor <coughs> we, we don't think you just feel your way into change we actually think you have to respond leave your nets leave your boats fire and so um, in a moment I just want to invite those who know that the Lord is speaking to them to stand and if you're watching this online um you may want to just do something like put your hand on your heart. Even if you're in a public space, put your hand on your heart. Just say, yeah, this is me. But it's important for us to say to the Lord, 
even with our bodies. Yes, I want to be a disciple. Yes, I'll follow you. Yes, I will pass through the valley of Borkor and make it a place of springs. Yes, I'll set my heart on pilgrimage. And um, it's going to be challenging. Now, I want to be clear. No one feel any pressure. I've, I've preached this message twice already. In one context, everybody stood. In another, not that many did. It doesn't really matter. I just want to know what the Holy Spirit is doing for you. This is between you and him. But if you're like, yes, Lord, I want to be a disciple. I want to change this year. I want to grow. Uh, in a moment, just stand. And those of you who don't feel called to stand, please, please know you are equally called and loved by God. There's no, it's not like those who stand are somehow more spiritual. It's just maybe that you don't need to. You know, when we go to the beach, we respond differently. 85-year-olds sit in their cars with thermos flasks and go, oh, and point at things. God bless you if you want to do that this year. And others get out the car and say, get me on the sand. They build a sand castle. God bless you. And others say, I want to go paddling. And others say, I want to go swimming. And some say, I want to learn to surf. And I believe some of you, God's saying to you, do you want to learn to surf this year? And if you say, I'd rather sit in the car with my thermos flask, you're saved by grace. God bless you. But if something in you is saying, I want to learn to surf this year, it's going to take effort. But it's going to be so much fun. So those of you who'd like to uh, respond, and this is between you and God. Just stand if you're able to do so where you are now. And those who don't sense this specifically for you, please remain seated. And just as his way plays, take a moment to tell the Lord why you're standing. Put it into words quietly. This is between you and him. We're not going to rush on. Take a minute. Tell him. And I just want to pray over you a blessing. This is from the Northumbria community based up there in and around Holy Island. This was a blessing spoken over me when I started my pilgrimage. I want to speak over you at the start of the journey of this year. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you this year. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's all just stand together and... Um, I don't know if we're going to worship or Bill is going to do anything, but I'd, I'd love us particularly to pray. In fact, maybe just I can't see Bill, so I'll just flow with this. Um, those of you who, who, who want to say, who want to just get some prayer now, because you're saying, I am in the valley of Borkor. My heart is breaking. I'm in a place of weeping and mourning, a very dry place, very difficult place. I kind of limped to church today. I just need the Spirit of God to come and renew me. Um, that, that's what happens when we come together as the body of Christ. There's always people who are in that place. And uh, we'd love just to pray for you now. And when we do, things often change. Sometimes the circumstances change, but always the Spirit of God meets with you to change the way you relate to the circumstances. It's a beautiful thing. It's a powerful thing. So uh, those of you who'd like to receive some prayer now, it's just all going to be a bit messy, but just raise your hand uh, so that we know who we're praying for and someone near you will pray. If you just keep your hand up, please, uh, those wanting to receive prayer. And if you're near them, just stretch out hand towards them. Um, if you want to, you could put a hand on the shoulder, but nowhere else, please. And, and let's just pray and invite the reign of God, the Spirit of God to come.
Come, Holy Spirit, now we ask you. Come, Holy Spirit. Come to these dry places. Come to these places of weeping. And bring fresh hope and fresh life. Come, Holy Spirit. Well done, guys. Come, Holy Spirit. There's lots of tears. That's fine. Just come, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you bind up broken hearts. You comfort those who mourn. Come, Holy Spirit. Keep praying, guys. You're doing great. Just keep praying. Work your mind. So you may want to speak a prayer out, or you may just want to be praying in your head, but work your minds. Don't go empty here. Don't just feel something. Just articulate something in your head or out loud as you pray for each other. This is the Hebrew way. got a, a, a word someone here you had a car crash this week and it was like the straw that broke the camel's back in a way it's a simple thing and a small thing but it it was just the end of a whole bunch of things and the lord just wants to say he loves you so much he loves you so much those of you watching online if you're with someone you'd like prayer from them just just ask them to pray for you. If they don't know Jesus yet, lead them to Jesus and then ask them to pray for you. Uh, and you're always welcome to join us at our prayer meetings at 8 a.m. every day, uh, if that's helpful to you. But God bless you, wherever you are. So good to hear from Pete. Thanks uh, for joining us today. If you've been touched at all by what Pete has said in the service, then head over to the Emmaus Road website uh, and get in touch. Please do get in contact because we'd love to hear from you. Amazing. Now we have the wonderful Natalie who is coming to share a bit about prayer with us. Hi everyone. Um, lovely to see you. And so we're just going to um, have a bit of time of prayer for our prayer meetings that normally happen in the morning, midday and evening daily. And um, one of the things that we've really been looking at is how God is going to move in 2022. He's done so much over the last two years and we are just so hungry to see more of him and to just experience more of his presence. So um, let's just have a time of prayer. Father God, we want to thank you so much for the way that you have shown yourself over the last two years. We thank you, Father God, that even though this pandemic has been really, really tough, that there have been some gems that have come out of it, and some of those things have been our Zoom prayer meetings. And Lord, we look ahead even more to 2022, and we ask, Father God, that you would fill us even more with your spirit, that we would be able to hear what is on your heart, and that we would be able to continue to pray and to worship you daily. And Lord, I just ask that you would, that there would be a real breakthrough in um, situations that we have been praying for, Lord, and that your hand would continue to be on this. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you'd like to join any of our prayer meetings, and um, we do meet on Zoom um, morning, midday and evening, and we have one called Nightwatch as well, all of that is on amazeroad.com forward slash prayer. And that is it for the service today. We, I hope that you have a wonderful evening. God bless you. Bye. Bye.